David Levin, and welcome to Pop Goes the Culture, the behind the scenes and untold TV stories you probably wouldn't have known from the stars and creators. Today, the final part of my interview with the legendary Sherwood Schwartz, creator of Gilligan's Island and The Brady Bunch. Today, Sherwood reveals his greatest disappointment. He lets us in on the secrets of the Brady House, the famous visitors to the set, the fun and issues in the Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island reunion shows, how Sherwood Schwartz stood up to ABC Network by doing an anti-tobacco episode on the Brady Bunch while cigarette ads were still on the air. Plus, as a longtime creator and producer, Sherwood Schwartz shares with us the strangest network note he ever got. Unfortunately, I have very few disappointments in my life. I, I'm spoiled, I guess, because I, I love my wife. I've loved her all these years. I love my kids. I have great kids. I have great grandchildren, and I have two great grandchildren. Everybody's fine. Everybody's, but I have a disappointment in my life. I did a show, uh, a backdoor pilot. It was really called Kelly's Kids about a, an a adopted family. And uh, I have a natural habit of going to CBS first because I did most of my shows at CBS early on. And I wanted to do Kelly's Kids as a series. So we did this backdoor pilot. It was an episode of the... As an episode of the, as an episode of the Brady Bunch uh, we did a, an, an episode called Kelly's Kids, and it was about a childless couple who adopt three kids. And it was, I thought, a good story and a good show. Now, unfortunately, I don't own things. I write things, and I, I through the Writers Guild, I can, I can copyright things, but I don't make my own pilots and I don't have the, the wherewithal to do that. Very few writers to do that. It's big companies that do that. So uh, uh, CBS, I forget who I did. No, this was ABC, I believe. ABC uh, owned this show called Kelly's Kids, which was my show. I mean, it was my show, but I did it as an episode of uh, the Brady Bunch, and because I'm not a standalone producer, I have to listen partly to what other people tell me who are providing the funds for my shows. And they insisted that I partner with another guy who was, at that point in my life, I was an old hand at writing and producing. And this young guy with a Broadway pedigree of some sort came aboard my show and had a different view of it than I did. I had a show where, and I think it's a valid show, where this couple have, without kids, adopt a, a they're white and they adopt this white kid. And He's lonesome for the adoption place where he was, and he has two friends that he was crying. And it was a good story, sentimental kind of story, where a kid is lonesome for his friends from the adoption home. And since they already provided all their, their uh, credentials for adoption, it was simple to extend it to two other kids because those are the two, his two best friends. And it turned out one was Asian and the other was black. So Kelly's Kids was about a white kid, a black kid, and an Asian kid. And I thought that was a good thing to do because that's what the world is becoming. Part this, part that. And well, the guy that they put me with thought it would be even more complicated and more interesting if one of, they had one kid of their own. And I maintain that it's wrong for somebody who has their own kid to go into, and adopt three others. It didn't make any sense to me. I said, here's a childless couple, and they want to adopt a kid. If people already have a kid, it's not that big a, 
a, a dramatic license to adopt. But I thought it was wrong. And uh, they thought otherwise. The network thought that this other guy had a more complicated way of saying the same thing. And I said, it's not a more, it's a more complicated way, but it's not saying the same thing. Because they would tend to, you, they would favor their own child in any discussion anyway. And I thought it was a wrong, it was a confusing signal for an audience. I want the audience to start at ground zero and build on three kids that they adopt. And so we parted company. But they spoiled my, my idea. So the show never, never went? It became a show. It did? Yeah, with Elliot Gould. Really? Yeah, was on briefly. Because originally it was with Ken Berry and, and... Yes, yes, but they put Elliot Gould in it. And I forget who played his wife. An, an attractive woman. That's the part of the story I didn't know. I thought I knew it all. No, no, that Together We Stand was the name of that show when it came on the air. And it was wrong. I think it was a wrong show. So that was the evolution. It was it started out on the Brady Fund. Yes. Turned into something else and became together. Yeah, and I left. All right. Well, that's a good story. I'm sorry it ended the way it did. Well, I it, would like to watch. I would watch that show with Ken Barry and Brooke, and Brooke Bundy. That would have been a nice show. It was a good show. Yeah, it was. It was, a good, it was the best pilot they had that year. But they, you know, too many cooks spoiled the broth. And it was, I was, as I said, I started off by saying I've had very few disappointments in my life. That was a serious disappointment for me, creatively, because I thought I had a really good show that would say something, you know, in, in, uh, in, the, in terms of the world we live in. It would say something, because it's hard to do that with comedy. And I thought that was a good way to do it. I have a few more questions, and I would love to go on for hours and hours, and I would love to sit down with you for eight hours one day, just like... <laughs> That's happened to me. <laughs> but I have other, and, and it's like, this is so much fun. First of all, Mike was an architect, and he designed this house with six kids and only one bathroom without a toilet. Well, what was he the, wasn't like, too bright. A dream house. <laughs> he was a, a good architect, but not very bright. <laughs> and no windows. There were no windows in any of the rooms. I'll tell you something worse. Hmm. The way the house, if you go through the evolution of the series, every time they looked out of the window, in any room they were in, they saw the backyard. And the window was inside, there's no windows. And nobody ever worried about it. How come on the front, when you look at the front of the house and you go inside, those stairs don't go anywhere? No. The famous stairs, if you look at the front of the That's house. That's right, there's no way. First of all, it was a one-story house that we shot it in. So the whole thing is a fake. <laughs> and what about the attic? How could he have a room in the How could Greg have a room in the attic? There's no attic. <laughs> that makes it tough. That's very tough. <laughs> well, don't there, there there is some there's some excuse for for this, but only if you're insane. <laughs> It's, I think it's called the dramatic license. Yeah. Very dramatic license. It has to be renewed every 20 minutes. <laughs> um, on the show, um, did any, any famous people come to visit the set other than people who were guest stars? Yes. We had a coincidence, a very interesting coincidence on the Brady Bunch. One week after another, we had the governor of New York State, Rockefeller, was there one week. Either the prior week or the following week, the Secretary of State, Kissinger, visited the set. Now, that's unusual. Not to be in the show, but visited the set. We had a lot of actors and people, but this was so unusual because they followed one, one week after another. Wow. Governor Rockefeller and uh, Kissinger was the Secretary of State. You've also got on on your shows both the Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island. So many sequels or cartoon versions or yeah. you know, every sort of iteration of the show you could. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? About some of the sequels and well, uh, both the 
shows of Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch must have set records of some some kind or another. Because first of all, the uh, Gilligan's Island was the first show to go back in time. And what became reunion shows was simply our way of doing an, uh, uh, excuse me, a two hour show. 15 years after the show ended, we did a reunion show, but it wasn't called a reunion show. It was just, uh, we, I don't know what, we didn't call it anything. We just did a two hour show. Rescue from Gilligan. Rescue, it was called Rescue from Gilligan's Island, but it wasn't meant to be a reunion. It, it was, uh, but it became the first of reunion shows, which I thought was, so it has a record of all these different things. There's seven different books written about Gilligan's Island, and eight, I think, about the Brady Bunch. People write all these books. I wrote one called Inside Gilligan's Island, and it was took four years to write, and it's absolutely true. Every word in that book is true, and so they wanted me to do a Brady Bunch book, but I don't have four years to spare anymore. It takes, I didn't know it took that long to write a it book. It takes a lot of time to write a book. Yeah. I know. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? Have we covered, uh, what should I ask Lloyd about? Uh, well, he's very proud of certain things uh, about the shows. We're both... None of, neither one of us want to push the envelope. We're very satisfied with the envelope the way it is. And he's very proud of the fact, as am I, that many, many of the stories in our own life and, and growing up in, in my house and his, his house as a kid were, gave the, or, are the basis of, of many episodes in the Brady Bunch, right, right, right from home. When, when did he start working with you? He started working with me, I think, just on the, he was too young in Gilligan's Island, but he started working as a dialogue coach on uh, Brady. He's a very bright guy. You'll, you, I, you'll have a very nice time with him. He's very bright. He's quick. and uh, uh, But he's very proud of the fact that they're good shows in terms of what they say. See, I'm very proud of the fact that I did the first anti-smoking half-hour show of anybody on the Brady Bunch. I was Greg, very much anti-smoking. I got I did one a show like that also. I'll tell you that later. Sorry. Yeah, but this was and we had a tobacco sponsor. <gasps> did you get in any trouble? Well, that's the only time I ever held my breath when I turned a script in, because I knew we had Liggett and Myers or one of those tobacco companies as a sponsor. And I must say this, for that tobacco company and for that network, there wasn't a whisper. I just turned in the script, and everybody said, good show, and that was it. I was, you know, you roll up your sleeves for a fight and it doesn't happen? My sleeves were rolled up on that. Strangest network note you ever got? The strangest one? Was on a show, the strangest one I ever got was on My Favorite Martian. I was there for the first year. Then I went off to do my own show with Gilligan's Island. The strangest note I ever got was from a CBS executive who on a, one of the scripts of Favorite Martian, there was a note saying, no Martian would ever talk like this. <laughs> CBS not only knew how America talks and how Europe talks, I know how Martians talk. That was a serious note. The guy obviously had worked on Orson Welles' uh, special <laughs> years earlier. That's the strangest note I ever got. In fact, somebody else took that and made it the title of a book. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. That was a serious note. No Martian would, no Martian would ever talk like this. <laughs> Mr. Schwartz, uh, thank you so much. This is oh. so much fun for me. It's fun for me, too. I'm David Levin. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Till next time, please leave me your comments and let me know what you think of the show. I read everyone. If you can't watch the video version, soon you'll be able to listen to our podcast. And if you're listening to our podcast, you can listen, watch us actually on YouTube at Pop Goes the Culture TV. 
please subscribe. Please follow Pop Goes the Culture on Twitter at PopGoCulture, Facebook, or email me at PopGoesTheCultureTV at gmail.com. And please subscribe to our Patreon campaign. Just a buck or two a month from you can help me keep doing these shows. And for three bucks a month, you get a chance to be on our live sister show, Ask Them Yourself. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.